turn. All right, we're all set up. Yeah, next week is Thanksgiving. Uh, so there won't be a meeting there. And I'll send out a you know, noon time reminder next Wednesday. Just no meeting. <laughs> um, let's see. Should we jump right in with the Grape 2 update? Oh, I should probably ask before we do, is there anything else that people want to discuss later as agenda items? If so, you can either tell me now or add them to yourself to the minutes. Rich, I'll say a word about the along eclipse path experiment. Yes, I have you down already. Good. Thank you. Cool. Rachel, I didn't get a chance to update, but I'm gonna I wanted to just review that uh that picture. Thank you. I'm in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If nobody and, else <laughs> Yes, and at the end, let's remind everyone of the frequency measuring test tonight. Might be of interest. Oh yeah. All right. Then we can jump jump straight into the grape two update. John, take it away. Um, let's see. <laughs> I got the all of the parts and the boards to the board manufacturer Tuesday, and I'm in a hurry up and wait loop for Scranton to cut a PO to pay them to be able to start the board build. So uh, that's in place. Uh, we're still chasing after a bug, an elusive one that I, it's failing on my system, but it's not failing on Bill's system, uh, where the Pico buffer overflows and crashes um other than that uh been doing the final tweaks to the board layout for the logic board to get the fiducials in the right place so they can use it without rails and in the process of creating the bill of materials for them and purchasing all of the remaining parts for the logic board build so yeah i did have a question in general so i there was a lot of discussion last week about the budget and whether or not the magnetometer was going to stay. The magnetometer Since is not staying on the normal distribution. Okay. Uh, it's up in the air. I mean, the, the interface is working. The software will be there. I will be running a magnetometer in mind. There'll be selective people who have the magnetometer boards that will be running them. I'm not sure if it's Nathaniel's intent to leave it up to the person if they want to purchase one or how that's going to work. I really don't know. Okay. Um, Dave has supplied a board that's just the remote board that we can do this with. We don't have, because right now, if you buy it through Tapper, you have to buy the local and the remote, remote board, and they want $120 for the pair. So it's a bit pricey that way. Are we now within budget? So I noticed you did have... Yes, Nathaniel's done some pencil sharpening and rearranging of things, and he's pulling from different sources, which is why I think he has to cut a PO for this these board builds since it's, I don't know. He's in the finances, I'm not. Um, but I think we are funded fully for the build of 35 boards. And that's okay. the, the assumption I am proceeding under. Cool. Just wanted to make sure all of that was tidied up because it seemed yeah. like our main issue last week. Because the remaining things I have to buy are 35 of the Leo Bodnars and 35 of the four terabyte drives. And then the 35 board build, which are the three last main multi-thousand dollar purchases. And the rest of the pieces parts will come from the cases NSF grant money. And as far as I know, that should finish it up. Um, I thought I'd never be able to say that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we're in good shape. At least as far as I can tell. Nathaniel, I guess, is on the road to a conference today, so he won't be here. Yes. But I believe we're in good shape. Okay. I don't think I have anything else unless Bill or Kung, you want to add anything? No. Actually, is Kung on or did he join Dr. Fursa? He is on. Yeah, Kung? I am. Uh, I do have some, just some small silver updates. So, the IT gave, gave the Pi a static IP. Hooray. So when I 
Yeah, I tested the connection. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! <laughs> yeah. It didn't work on campus or off campus either. So uh, either way. So now I have to wait for a few more days until that get resolved. So uh, now I have to resort to just staying in the, the ham shack and just work on directly on the pie. Um, so I'm fixing a book that John found where where data just not get written to the to the file like a few seconds of it. So I found out the issue was when I when I try to open a new file when the at the start of the new day, I completely forget to take care of closing the day, the files from the previous day. So I'm trying to fix that, and uh, that. yeah, <laughs> there was a there was a stupid bug there. It's a bit mistake for me. And um, John just gave me some new files from David Castan, so we yes. tried to integrate that into the system. Excellent. Yeah, that's yeah. that's it for me. Let me know when you get that incorporated so I can try it out. I will. And just to clean up a spot of old business, we had the uh, time syncing issue like a yeah. few weeks ago now. Is that still something we're working on? Uh, no, that I think that can be closed. Oh. Um, that's all working. Any all updates? No. Bill, did you have any other updates? Uh, John fixed my RF deck. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's a solder joint uh, bridge that I didn't notice. <laughs> that I created. <laughs> so uh, now that's working. Uh, and I'm just focusing full time on, on this buffer overflow problem that I can't reproduce. So uh, uh, just, you know, it takes a long time to run it for it to appear. And um, I'm trying to put in an instrumentation in the code to uh, to detect it and, and uh, recover from it. But uh, I don't know why it's actually happening yet. But it's one of those tough ones. <laughs> okay. And actually, the... Overflow happens on the Raspberry Pi side rather than the Pico side. So, oh, yeah. Uh. But we, I did uh, cut the CPU usage down from 100% to 17 or so percent by changing the delay uh, parameter uh, between reads. So that's that's a good that's good progress. On so instead of taking one hundred percent of one core on the Raspberry Pi, it now takes about seventeen percent to do. That's the uh, the reader thread that is reading the data from the Pi over USB. And the new code that David provided is going to give us a peak voltage as well as the frequency measurement. Uh, he's still working on. If we have a frequency that's off by two hertz, if it's going to work or not, um, that's yet to be determined. Um, but the one he has working now is to within 100 microhertz, which is pretty respectable. <laughs> that's a darn respectable. Um, the next things that are on the list for us to work on are the magnetometer control as well as uh, there was another major one. Oh, the, the, the testing. I have to create a piece of test code to be able to test the 36 boards that I'm going to be getting for automation so I can put in a serial number and then run the six frequency tests on all three channels to make sure that everything is working. Because boards do not come back from the manufacturer all working. They all have to be tested and debugged and fixed. So in my free time, I'll be doing that. Yeah, it'd be the RF deck boards. Yeah. After I get them back. But like I say, we're in a hurry up and wait hold pattern until the PO is cut. So the board, board manufacturer is chomping at the bit, but they're just going to have to wait. 
Okay. Originally, I thought we were going to give him a credit card number, but I think we would have maxed out Nathan's credit card, so or Nathaniel's credit card. Oof. <laughs> yeah. I told him I knew how to melt them, so and I got two more purchases that are well beyond his 5,000 limit, so... Okay. Any other updates on the grape too? No, I think that's enough for one week. That's lovely. We came down under 15 minutes for the grape two update. Okay. We did a um, lot shorter. <laughs> back to net. I'm going to consider this may be later down in business. Was there any further discussion on the amplitude drop-off issues that we've been talking about? Yes. Well, yeah, go ahead, David. I corresponded with Matt Deutsch, chief engineer at WWV. He said it's not on their side. That's good. Um, I think it's something's going, something's happening in the sound card, I think. That's what it looks like. So we need somebody who has the time to to run a test to uh, try inputting a signal into a, a grape one at various signal levels until the and see if they can get see if they can reproduce it. Is there some way of seeing that immediately as you increase the amplitude, or do you have to wait five minutes for it to crank through? Well, uh, that I, I can easily set that up, but I, I need to take my thing offline and inject a kilohertz signal. But I need to well, know how, no, how well, I know it's doing it. What I'd like to do is inject a signal into the input of the grape, not not a kilohertz, but a 10 megahertz signal. Oh, okay. I can do that too. And try it at various amplitudes. And um, you know, there is a dis there's when you're running the grape one with GNU radio, there's two displays. There's one that's the slow. Uh, waterfall and there's another one that updates about every three seconds and uh, I'm just guessing here but I think at some signal in, in level input you're going to see the amplitude of that drop rather than continue to go up. So you so, got that band pass and they have a little spike in it and then you think the spikes yeah. Can drop? Yeah I think that you're going to see the whole thing drop. Oh okay. Uh, somewhere in the signal chain between the input to the grape and the output of the sound card, somewhere it's getting cut off uh, once it reaches a certain amplitude. That's my theory. As because an interesting note, last night I was running a test F F FMT session with the uh, WWV Amateur Radio Club. And right in the middle of one of the testings, it dropped down for two seconds that exact block while we were receiving it. So it's there's something going on. And it might be, you know, naturally occurring or whatever it, it's outside of our system. It may not be a signal processing chain problem, but I will I'll try and get to that this week. I should be able to get some time. It's only gonna take about an hour. Because I, I looked at the the results of a lot of stations and it's happening on every station that seems to have a good antenna. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, it doesn't happen on my station because the antenna that I have is an 80 meter dipole and the alignment of such is that it's l aligned exactly wrong to pick up WWV. It's, it's you know, it's hung in trees and the, you're feeding that off the end up in a direction pointing to the to the west. So I get a signal, but I, it never gets the signal doesn't get strong enough to drive this thing into this overload mode was apparently what's happening. But since we've seen this on both the uh, DRF systems and the uh, the uh, other, the, the legacy system, um, it's got to be somewhere before the software. Yeah, I think uh, that's almost a very compelling reason that it's our so compelling evidence that it's our software. Um, it's not, we're not talking about it. Is not, it is not our software. 
right? I said, well, sure and well, not we don't see it at the same time on the grape systems because I have right. to I'm running off the exact same RF source and I don't see it on the FL Digi ones. I just see it on the digital RF ones. Well, if you take a look at if that, uh, Rachel, you just you were showing it a few minutes ago, uh, the FL Digi uh, composite display. And uh, there's, there's a, there's yes, that. this one. No, no. FL Digi composite display. You had it for a, you had it there for about a half a second. Uh oh, oh FL that Digi. One, that one, that one, not yeah. that one. Amplitude. That one, yeah. Now, if uh -huh. I bring up if I bring up all of the great uh, uh, DRF uh, plots uh, for that day. The drop off yeah. you see there is exactly mm -hmm. the same drop off at exactly the same time. Yeah. These are all in different locations. Right. Hmm. Well, so this is the New England group. Um, so right. We're all in the same region, but yeah, different, you know, within 20 miles of each other. Mm -hmm. There's even a different frequency. Yeah, there's a five megahertz in there too. But mine and Cleveland matched it. I think it was the ionosphere. Yeah, I do. That's what I think. And Matt said it wasn't them. I <laughs> yeah. I I think it's the ionosphere for what it's worth. I think we should double check our device because that will give us uh, better information. The fact that it's at the same time is a little peculiar. Yeah. A lot of you look at in the ionosphere travels. Um, well, so you, this group here is all located pretty close to each other, so they would see it at the same well, time. Yeah. Well, well, all of them. There's different amplitude levels, so that tells me it's not, you know, if it's a 20 mile radius, maybe think, the phenomenon think, is 20 miles big. Which one is this, uh, Bill? This is the the northeast uh, group. Okay. So, yeah, we're all there's one one in Maine, but uh, all the rest of us are pretty clustered together. So I think we're seeing the same ionosphere effect there, but, does, except the five megahertz one. That's the brown one. You know, I'll stay here. I'm blow this up. Where, where's the? Um, do you have the uh, the wide range plot? Uh, no day but somewhere in my email i can i can share that if you want this is on 11 and 08 let's see yes let me just go pick that up hang on but i think if john has if you have time to check the um yeah i can vary the input level of the, the signal yeah. generator and see what i can how badly i can beat it up yeah well, because if we can force the phenomenon to happen um, in lab. ten, it's probably not an ionospheric thing. Correct. Which would be, um, but if we can't get it to work, um, uh, then we we'll probably have a list of other things to try. <laughs> well, this is a, Ocean, uh, Indiana is in there. Yeah. Indiana. So uh, yeah, we've added Goshen, Indiana. And Lady Smith, British Columbia, there, and so the Goshen one is the orange one here, and it sees it. It's wider. It's wider. Mm. Yeah. So, and, the, and so does the, the Lady Smith, British Columbia, if you think yeah, about it, but it's much wider. Purple one, and it it's wider. It starts here and ends up over here. Yeah, here one Who's of the, the things that one? can be happening here is if. If this is being caused by propagation getting real good at that time and signal levels go up pretty high, uh, various stations are going to experience that differently. So if the, if the problem is being caused by the propagation get high enough that it's overloading the front end of the receiver system, uh, that's going to be experienced differently at different stations. But the stations that are all in one geographical area, like the Northeast, would see it about the same time. That's, that's a 30 dB change. Yeah, thousand to one. Yeah, 
And I, I have any number of plots here from that same day that show exactly the same phenomenon. Not all of them, uh, but 90% of them. But look at the purple one. It goes up to minus 10 dB and it doesn't experience it there. So that's yeah, telling me that there's this might be a phenomenon we're actually seeing an attenuation. But I will definitely overload the front end and see what it does. Yeah. Well, it is happening at the same time as some pretty significant Doppler shift at least in this example. Yeah, but the fact that the level goes up to minus 10 and doesn't cause craziness in there, yeah. Yeah, that's, there's a Doppler shift at the same time. So there's Great. something going on there. Yeah, British Columbia is away. Oh, it yeah. got hammered. Yeah. <laughs> Although that... There's an interesting note on 10 megahertz last night after would have been after nine o'clock. I had WWVH coming in stronger than WWV. I mean, it was just like 30 dB over the other one, which is very unusual. <laughs> and, they were here, and I think it was David was hearing it in uh, New Jersey. Is that where he's at? New England? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. It's one of those new groups. Yeah. But yeah, it was coming in really strong because you get the woman's voice at 44 sec or 46 seconds, and then the man's voice would show up at 52. But yeah, 10 megahertz. Um, yeah, that was sure. 10 megahertz. It was 10 megahertz. Um, Hawaii was equal to uh, Colorado, and in 15 megahertz, uh, I could only hear Hawaii. Yeah, I here Only in here. Fort Collins, here in Fort Collins, it was the exact same thing. I could hear Hawaii better than WWV 13 miles away, so or eight miles away. So well, let, me, uh, let me point out something. WWVH, its antennas are all cardioid pattern to the west, except 2.5 megahertz. So you're essentially hearing a QRP station in Hawaii, except on 2.5. Last night, I was hearing the female voice on 2.5 pretty well. But you may want to take a look at on your waterfall relative strengths of the 500 and 600 hertz tones as they're sent simultaneously by the two stations. Well, the thing I did last night is after the FMT, I put FL Digi in the WWV mode and had the, the floating scope looking at the second tick. And very distinctly at about 9.15, it shifted over and I was receiving only WWVH and I could watch it moving as it wandered off. And to clarify that, WWV's second ticks are at 1,000 hertz. WWVH's are at 1,200. Yeah. But WWV's was just completely screwed up and H was showing up. Anyway, yeah. Something weird happened last night. Back to net. That's fair. Um, we can talk about it more too if we have a little bit of time in open forum. Uh, for the initial press release and everything and the paper since Dr. Frizzell is here, I'm just gonna skip this section. Um, unless there was scary, unless you know that there was a volunteer for the web press release on uh, the Thursday evening telecon or afternoon. More. Should have checked if Gary was here before calling him out. <laughs> so for the um, press release, it's being written by Ed Efchak, and uh, I gave him more information yesterday, uh, more plots from the TDOA group, and uh, he's going to include those as well. Uh, I don't think I spelled that name anywhere close to correct. <laughs> That's right. I think the SH becomes a C. H. CH? I think the S becomes a C. That looks better somewhat. <laughs> oh, Mary, um, just a note for your daughter. There are 248 surface mount components on the RF deck. So I thought you weren't interested, so I wouldn't send it, but you want me to yeah, send it? Yeah, yeah. That's just way too much. <laughs> okay, never mind. Yep. But thank you for the offer again. Later. Um, 
since Gary's not here, I assume we're also just skipping website updates. And, okay, for the University of Alabama site, Bill, did you have any updates on this? Yeah, j just one little thing that we put on this week. Um, we noticed that there are, I don't know, half a dozen, a dozen uh, folks who have created an account in a station but aren't really part of the upload group. And they show up as red on the on the map. So I added another rule in there that if a station is um, has never uploaded any data, it it gets an inactive status and it's not plotted on the map. So the the current map was showing us, you know, a kind of unrealistically bad uh, sample of how many stations we have that are active. So anyway, so that's in that's in place now. Also, um, if anybody is, I have to talk with Joe W7LUX about this. A lot of his, uh, all of his uploads are failing, I believe, because he might still be using the instrument name instead of the instrument ID because we dropped support for uh, the uploading using the instrument ID. So I'll be contacting directly about that. I think that's what's going on. All his uploads are failing. I downloaded his data directly and it looks great so it must be that so station id instead of name uh instrument id instrument Instru id Thank you for fixing that, Bill, because now my little green flag in Ohio isn't obliterated by a red one. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, yes, I, this I, does I, look I'm much more optimistic. I'm yeah, a free man. I'm putting finishing in touches on getting a, um, a, uh, a data collection and uploader package that runs on a flex radio. Um, I'm getting some final bugs out of that and probably will document that and put that out first part of next year because I know there's two or three people who have a flex radio. And the nice thing about that is you got multiple slices so you can have one slice doing this and use the radio for other things. And it'll just create little gaps in the data, but everything tolerates that. So. Okay. Very nice. Um, yeah, and this will also give us a much better view on which stations are having trouble um, so that we can actually know that information. Um, Gary is not here, but he did want to talk a little about support for the existing grape stations. So if anybody else sh has more info on that or shares that concern, um, we can talk about that. If not, I can ask Gary about it uh, next week. Okay, moving on to new business and slash kind of old business. Um, Dave, you had an update on your ground observations after talking to Steve Sirwin. Sirwin. Okay. I yeah. think I'm on there, am I? Okay. Yep. Um, I was going to share a screen. Perfect. And, uh, let me see if I can... I'm on, a, I'm on two computers, sorry. Um, let me see if I get this to work. Just two? Just to John. All right. This is the picture that I showed you guys last week, right? I think a couple weeks ago now. Or a couple weeks ago, correct. And um, we were getting this uh, interesting AM pattern showing up on here. And so I sent that photo to Steve, and um, he came back with a very lengthy uh, letter to me. and. 
uh, suggested all kinds of things that could be causing it. Could be um, problems with uh, nearby equipment with the 10 megahertz, getting some intermod created. He thought uh, connections, uh, I've got very good grounding in the place, by the way. Ward, you'd be proud of me. I've got everything bonded. It's solid. Um, <laughs> the uh, other one might have been some bad out of band signals coming in, bad metal connections, intermods, uh, loose connections can do that type of thing as well. There is a nearby AM station that is pretty strong, and I pick it up on my SDR sometimes. So it could have been, you know, something coming from overloading the receiver. I think it could have been just overloading the receiver. And at the end of this letter that he wrote, he commented that. Uh, the thing to do would be to add an attenuator. So I didn't have any attenuators that I could put in there. So I ordered those up from DX Engineering, and they showed up last night. And I had fun putting that in. And the results are kind of interesting. Looking at uh, what I've got this morning, this is the view of everything this morning. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, um, so I, I, I don't have a, um, you know the, the AM signal showing up. But interestingly enough, I mean, you know, when you go back and you look at the WWV, here it is, the uh, our famous FL Digi. And of course, FL Digi only tunes in one frequency and then records that, that frequency. And the best signal coming in is WWV here in Fort Collins. Although, as we were just talking about, WWVH oftentimes comes through very strongly from, from time to time. There are a few graphs that over here in the morning, I get a little bit of a peak showing up here. And I'm wondering on the FL Digi if I'm getting WWVH over WWV for some mm -hmm. reason. And I'm starting to pick that up. And that is, whoops, let me go back to the other photo. And that's really exemplified here. The neat thing about the digital radio is that we get the full bandwidth. We don't just get one signal, we get everything. And um, I'm definitely seeing a Doppler shift. This is uh, taken, oh, an hour ago. So that is a morning D-layer yeah. shift forming. And the question is from what? What signal is doing that? Because my WWV right down the middle is awesome. But am I also picking up WWVH? And am I picking up a Doppler shift in WWVH? And I'm reporting money on that one. Yeah. So all of a sudden, my really boring observations from Fort Collins, Colorado are getting interesting because we've got two different signals coming in here, I think. Yeah. And um, cool. this is just, this is the first image I've seen of it this morning. So um, it'll be fun to let this run and uh, I'll let you scientists figure out what's going on. It's kind of, kind of cool. That's it. That's my update. <laughs> It'd be great if you can uh, detect the tick at, uh, uh, 1200 hertz instead of a thousand. Well, That's does the, easy way to the do that. Radio that up? Does will the digital radio pick up the different frequencies of the tick? Well, you're not looking at the frequency of the tick, you're looking at the carrier. The, I'm looking at the carrier, but look, look for the 500 or 600 hertz tone. I think it'd be easier. That might be easier, yeah. But yeah, I don't, you know, looking plus or minus five hertz around the carrier, so he's not going to see the difference between the two. No, not on this display, but you know the right. data probably has it in there, though. If we, you know, yeah, analyze it differently. So, yep. But I thought this was really interesting to see that show up, and that I'm receiving. I think both stations, and um, you could differentiate them. So, because if he opens the bandwidth up to 1200 hertz, we could see everything. You probably see both WWV and WWVH. I, One of the questions I, I, I watched. Yeah, I'd have to. Uh, Pardon. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I watch for for the five and six hundred hertz tones by by using the spectrum display on FL Digi set for for twelve hundred and twenty hertz bandwidth, so I can see both the six hundred hertz tone sidebands and the five hundred hertz tone sidebands. And and here in New England, WWVH puts in a pretty good signal a lot of times in the evening so yeah i can I see that on my waterfall on fl digi here in colorado i can see the five and six hundred uh you know simultaneously what's kind of cool is you can see them switch you know yes, because well, that's, that's why i say i think that's a very good way to pick up the difference between wwv and wwvh and 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 you know the difference between the 
amplitude of the sidebands is pretty much the difference between the signals, I would believe. So yeah, can I get a word in? Um Christina well, that, and oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, that's all I wanted to show you. Go ahead, um, David. Okay, it must be two years ago already. Christina and John and I nibbled at software that would distinguish the 500 and the 600 hertz modulations. And it, you know, you know the schedule going in, so that gives you a way of examining the two stations separately. It's a complicated problem. The best solution we came up with was a Costas loop that would track the two sidebands independently. One complication of that is that those modulations have a guard time around the second ticks. So they're not continuous tones over the 30 or so second period that they're transmitted. It's not impossible though. And I don't know that it's all of our energy right now, but I think that is worth pursuing maybe after Eclipse. The nice thing about the new grape two data is it will incorporate a four kilohertz wide bandwidth of everything at an eight kilohertz sample rate. So all of this information will be kept and saved. So we have it for future reference. Yeah, Rachel, you might say in their uh, phase lock loop variant. Variant. Uh, the Costas loop. That is fair. Um, flavor. Okay. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> okay, and did you want to talk a little bit about the long path experiment? Yeah, thank you. I'll say only a few words here. It's peripherally related to the Grape 2 project. Many of you know uh, my eclipse project over the summer, and it's going to be fairly intense going into the eclipse, is monitoring CHU Canada along the path. By coincidence, the Great Circle Path from roughly Cleveland to Austin coincides with the Eclipse Path. As the moon's shadow gets north of Cleveland, the moon's shadow turns east, but the extension of the Great Circle Path continues to Ottawa. So CHU's second ticks turn out to be a nice radar signal of opportunity, and we are setting up a trap line of listing stations from Austin to Cleveland and a control station in Ottawa. It, it will be a substantially different experiment from the WWV observations, and it's a once ever test. I've gone through eclipse paths last century and the next several, though in, the, in, in that period, there aren't any eclipses that line up with one of the beacon stations in that way. If this is, if this experiment is successful, we can set up amateur radio transmitters along Eclipse Path, but for the beacon stations, this one's unique. Uh, we have an undergraduate senior project student, Laura Schwartz, Alpha Charlie One Papa Whiskey, who is working with Christina and me in that. We have a high school club in Austin that is an exceedingly involved high school club. It's like the high school equivalent of our college club. They will be our very first target data recording spot. If we only get one, it will be them. But we also have St. Louis University in St. Louis, their amateur radio club. We have Indiana State University in Indianapolis and a few individuals along the path. So uh, Austin TIN. So follow, yep. Yep. watch this space. The great receivers may wind up getting involved because John, by coincidence before I looked at the map beginning of summer and saw this was possible, had included the CHU frequencies in grape two. I think that's enough for now, any, unless there are any questions. Okay. Very cool. Okay, we are only at 41 minutes. Uh, does anyone else have any um, discussion points or announcements that they'd like to make? I have a question. Um, the uh, input bandpass filter on the uh, receiver board, how um, is the, uh, are the response curves available for that? Um, I'm wondering if uh, how susceptible these boards are to receiver overload from outer band signals, particularly if they're installed in an active 
ham radio station where there might be a strong local signal on some other HF frequency. Yeah, the grape one is a resonant LC filter uh, with 5% parts. So you can, you know, the, the Q of it is is not, you know, 10 hertz or anything like that. It's a couple of megahertz. Um, but on the grape two, the front end has an active RF amplifier. And if you overload that, you are going to get harmonics and splatter and all kinds of stuff. Because I know by me here in Macedonia, I've got a local 1100 AM station that is putting out 50 kilowatts in the 2.5 megahertz gets splattered badly on my mag loop. So if you've got electronics in front of it, it's going to be a problem. If you don't, probably not. Okay. Um, because it's relatively easy to design fairly good outboard filters that could be added um, in uh, in line with the antenna. So maybe I'll look yeah. at that. I'll write that down I, as something to take a look at. I I I have a noisy neighbor, noisy neighbor, uh, <laughs> called called the uh, an ionospheric sounder among other things, and. Uh, I have to I have to put in some uh, some bandpass filter to to keep the front end from from the grape from overloading. Yeah, there's nothing that can be done about that for you know overload versus sensitivity is always a battle, and the front end LC does a pretty good job of knocking things out. But if you've got a really strong signal that's you know 40 dB over or something that a bandpass filter probably is appropriate, but you'd have to put it on a scope and look at it. I know, a... What I warn you about is that the interaction between the grape one front end and the antenna is direct. So if you put two grapes on there at different frequencies, they will cancel each other with the bandpass filters. So the grape antenna, it wants its own antenna. So don't try and run anything else on it because it'll, it'll attenuate it significantly. That's why it's cheap. <laughs> yep. Okay. Any other either questions, comments, concerns, discussion, or troubleshooting requests? A little bit more detail from 88Y on the uh, the frequency measuring test. If you if you dare to challenge Case tonight, um... <laughs> may, the may, may the greatest nerd win. But yes, it's tonight. Call up is nine thirty Eastern time. It'll last about an hour. It's fun. Enter. I put the ARL's notification of it in the chat. Okay. Um, yes, and I've gone ahead and added that to the minutes. And just a reminder, there's no meeting next week. So when Thanksgiving, um, when we close, we will, um, not talk again for two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> does anyone have any, in light of that, does anyone have an, any last final comments, questions in regards? Otherwise, I will let us go early. All right. Seeing none. Thank you. Seven three, everybody. Seven three. Good Thanksgiving.